Hi everyone, welcome to week three of our homegrown gardening series. This week we're focusing on pests and diseases. I have Ben and James joining me again today, but unfortunately we couldn't get outside because it's a little bit cold and wet. So we are talking to you live from my sound booth. Not as exciting as my garden, I'm afraid, but hopefully the content in this um, presentation you'll find really interesting. Anyway, without further ado, let's dig in. Pretty similar really, isn't it? With the the uh, the COVID-19 still in isolation and, and even more so today when we're, we're talking about gardening and yet we can't even be in the garden. So we have, as we mentioned before, brought some garden into us. Um, so it's, it's, I suppose, a little more relevant. Um, this, I suppose, keeping in mind as well from, from our last two weeks, this, this is, um, it's all about introduction to gardening. So we're, we're going to be talking um, in very sort of basic terms, um, but we're also going to be um, skimming over lots of, lots of content um, in, the, in the few weeks that we're doing this too. So we're tr trying to cover as much as possible. Um, the, in, over the series, uh, um, you will notice that we are talking about some similar things and, and one of those things is, is healthy soil. Um, we've, we've talked about it at length in the last two and we will, we will again today, I'm sorry. But uh, look, a healthy garden is all about a healthy soil. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned, we're also going to be talking about sort of the importance of biodiversity and um, diversity within your gardens as well. So I guess um, pests, initially when you talk or you, you hear mentioned um, gardening and pests, people commonly think about those, you know, the pesky ones that um, you often have in the garden, cabbage moth, snails, slugs, um, uh, coddling moth, slater beetles, um, earwigs. Um, they're all, always the ones that probably I'm sure yourself, Ben, and, and I always get asked, asked about are those ones and, and how, how do we stop them? How do we, we get rid of them? Um, the thing with pests is um, they are a normal part of the cycle. So um, we're always going we're to... Always, we're always going, always going to... Who's on? Who's on? Can someone mute? Can someone mute? Are you getting feedback as well, getting feedback as well, Ben? No. No. All good, mate. Okay. Okay. Okay, that should be okay now, James. I've muted everyone. Okay, I've unmuted right. me. Um, so as I was saying, yeah, look, pests are a pretty common uh, component to gardening. So um, we, we do have to learn how to deal with them. And, and as, as we're talking about today, the, the diversity and biodiversity is a, is a really key aspect um, in avoiding those pests. So we are gonna be talking about avoiding them a lot. Um, I guess the other thing to consider as well is, is there is a lot more pests than just the insect variety um, in our garden. So if we think about gardening, well, depending on where you are, um, We've got some people, Andre, you're in Belvray, so rabbits, kangaroos might be a problem for you. Um, someone in, in Janjuk, um, possums might be. People with chooks, they, they will um, no doubt get in the garden. Um, myself and Ben, we have uh, kids, so toddlers are definitely a pest in the garden as well, um, particularly when you're planting seedlings and they walk along behind you, pulling them out as you plant them. Um, but even, even sort of the ones that are considered as, you know, natural beauties like king parrots, um, love tomatoes. So there are a number of pests and finding a suitable um, solution for these ones, are, I guess, um, very individual and, and we need to sort of look at them specifically to, to how we best combat them. If we look at say one like rats, um, rats are common, particularly if you've got a compost and if you've got chooks and there's a few things you can do um, pretty quickly to, to combat that. For one, if you've got chooks, um, feeding them scraps in the morning so that the chooks have time to actually eat the scraps through the day um, and then the rats can't access them. Um, if it's rats in compost, putting down a wire mesh on the ground um, so that rats can't actually dig through and get up into the compost. So there is simple sort of techniques to, um, yeah, to overcoming those sort of pests. We can, as Sarah mentioned at the start, we can actually go into that later on. Um, and yeah, certainly if there's questions around your specific pests in your garden, might be a neighbor, might, who knows what it is. Um, we, can, we can try and, and help you out with those, those things. Um, but as I said, pests are a pretty normal part of gardening. 
I'm going to throw to Ben to talk about diversity in your garden and, and specifically um, increasing biodiversity, which is, which is crucial in any garden, I think. Okay. Thanks, James. And thanks everyone for tuning in uh, this week on a very cold morning. I feel like we uh, would love to be out in the garden and uh, showing you some of the plants that we're going to talk about today, but uh, it's also quite nice to be here having a cup of tea in a warm little room. Um, so James has sort of touched on, I think in my experience as a gardener, it's probably the question that I get uh, the most is, how do you deal with this pest, whatever it is? It might be, especially this year, time of year, it might be cabbage moth or James has reeled off, you know, earwigs and all sorts of wonderful pests that enter our garden. Um, I want to talk about sort of from my experience and James can add, add his experience as well is uh, gardens that are diverse and full of, and when I talk about diversity, we'll talk about how you can build diversity within your garden, but don't just think diversity above above the ground. Again, James and I are sort of hammering home this point about soil, but having diversity underneath your soil is critical um, as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some strategies that we can use uh, to get diversity into your garden. So my garden at home, even in a small space, and this will, everyone's got different uh, options uh, to build diversity and you might just have a balcony for example or a very small garden space you can still for example get herbs into that into that area whereas someone who's on a bigger property might be able to plant um, more native plants for example to bring in beneficial birds and insects um, when we're talking about building diversity you need to plant a range of a range of things so we can talk about first attracting insects. So I want to talk about uh, a couple of key uh, groups of uh, plants that you can start putting into your garden, which are going to attract, especially insects. Um, so we've got, I don't know if we can see this. Can you see these guys? James, is that coming up? Got it loud and clear. Looks like a rose. Okay. It's, it's not a rose. No, <laughs> it's not. It's an agapanther. No, it's not an agapanther. Okay, so here we've got a beautiful example of some dill that's gone to flower. So I went out to a, a garden on the weekend um, to get some tomatoes actually, and they had a row of these growing along the tomatoes, um, some San Manzano tomatoes that I was picking. And there were a bunch of ladybugs within this plant. Um, so it's from the umbrella group of family uh, plants. Now there's a range of plants that you put in your garden um, that you can let go to seed um, and flower. And more importantly, if you let them go to flower, they'll bring in some really amazing insects, um, which will be predators for the bad insects that are coming into your garden and munching on, on whatever it is in your garden. So I think we're, what I want to get across is to look at your garden a bit more holistically and not specifically going, why is why are my cabbage seedlings getting munched and how do I deal with that specific problem? You gotta look at your garden as a whole and go, well, how can I bring in pet, um, predatory insects and birds? Um, so planting things like parsley, dill, uh, coriander, um, and you don't have to let them all go to flower and seed because that will take up quite a bit of space. But even letting one of those plants, just I'd encourage you guys like this time of year, put in some parsley, put in some coriander, let it go to flower and seed and come, you know, end of winter into spring. You'll see these, you know, go out and have a look at these and have a real close look. And suddenly you'll see a lot of diversity, even within the one plant, you might see, seven or eight insects and some some things you won't see um, but they're all providing a function in your garden is that they're uh, bringing in like ladybirds for example will take care of a lot of aphids you know they can eat 400 aphids in a in a session so um, James did you want to add anything uh, to that at all 
Um, oh, yeah, another beneficial insect at the moment that's getting around quite a bit is the praying mantis. Um, beautiful at eating aphids. Um, so yeah, they are they're pretty prevalent at the moment. I'm not sure about in your garden, Ben. Um, but if we move on from insects, uh, we can we can certainly look at birds um, and encouraging birds to come into your into your garden, which is a really important aspect. Um, so a lot of the little native birds, um, which we might look at, so blue wrens, scrub wrens, um, are definitely in a lot of um, suburban areas on the decline um, due to cats. Um, so cats cats are sort of you know, there's a lot of the larger birds around, um, particularly if we look at sort of the leafy green areas like Janjuk, like Anglesey, Aries Inlet. Um, but it sort of it take, only takes a few cats that can um, wipe out and, and decimate a lot of these birds if they're let outside. Um, so encouraging these birds um, is, is really important and, and doing um, native plantation. Um, of endemic and indigenous species is really important. Um, there was a problem on, on a few years back and it had a really quite a large garden area, which, which wasn't overly productive um, in terms of growing vegetable, um, sort of vegetables and fruits. So one of the first things I did there was actually um, plant around a thousand um, indigenous plants to that area. Um, within about six months, we had this massive turnaround of, of bird life. Um, from that though, we also, so I did it planting around a wetland as well, or a dam, which we converted into a wetland, but we had four species of frogs within um, sort of nine months. Um, we had yeah, a range of birds that came in uh, because they had the, their sort of natural habitat to actually um, inhabit. So doing things to your garden, which we're talking about growing food, um, there's a direct correlation with, with actually um, planting a diverse um, garden as well. So keep that in mind. It's not just all about going out and planting carrots and, and broccoli. Um, it is actually, there's a lot more to it than that. And just on that, James, I think, you know, depending on the size of your garden, like uh, my garden's just a suburban backyard, so not a huge garden, but uh, within that, I've planted specific plants to bring in, let's take beneficial birds. Um, salvias are a really good option. Um, like James, you mentioned, you did quite a large planting at the last place. Even putting in a couple of specific plants um, like salvias can bring in eastern spinebills and what they'll do is they'll come in and feed on the nectar of that plant when it's in flower but they don't just take off again they see an opportunity and they'll if you watch birds within your garden watch blue wrens watch silver eyes all these little birds they're fantastic birds in your garden because they'll take care of a lot of the issues when come back to pest and integrated test um, pest management um, birds are just one one of the tricks up your sleeve, I suppose. The other tricks that you know we're going to touch on today is, uh, you know, some of those plants that we talked about to let them go to seed and flower. Um, we also talk about we haven't really talked about herbs yet, James. Um, at my house at home, along the borders, I do a lot of um, borders with wormwood or rosemary or lavenders. All of these plants not only as a border hold the soil in, so coming back to soil and um, integrating that into your system, um, it's also a barrier from whether it's a slug, whether whatever insect it is, it's just one more layer within your garden that is going to confuse your pests. And because when we talk about insects, insects, they smell or they see what they're after. So. If you're at home and you put, let's say you put in a new veggie garden this weekend and you go down and buy seedlings, if you're lucky enough to get seedlings, um, and you just do one big block of cauliflower and let's say cauliflower and broccoli, if I'm a cabbage moth, once they come up and I'm flying around, I'm going to look at that and go, thanks, Ben, you've just put, you know, put it on a dinner plate for me. Whereas if that cabbage moth is flying around, and suddenly has to contend with all these different other plants within your veggie garden or an eastern spine bill up on its shoulder or you know all the, a predatory insect we're trying to make a system which is diverse now do, it's easy to just say make a diverse system but we're i think today we're, we're trying to give you different strategies 
whether it's planting, whether it's soil building your soil, whether it's putting, you know, a rock rocks in your garden to attract lizards. Lizards take care of lots of uh, um, pests as well. Fro James mentioned frogs. Um, the other thing is using chickens. So if you've got chickens at home, chickens can be a wonderful tool in your garden to use to clean up insect issues. Obviously, you don't want them out when you're planting your, your young seedlings and it's a bit trickier. But again, chickens are another um, method that we can use. James? Oh, yeah, if I can sort of elaborate as well on the... Um the flowers, the side of things, which I'll, I'll throw back to my beautiful pot of nasturtiums that I've um, brought inside with me today. Um, so yeah, different, different flowers like herbs give off beautiful scents, um, which do two things um, in, in, in terms of insects, can either attract insects or repel insects. Um, so one like nasturtiums, for instance, um, is uh, repels aphids, so aphids don't like the smell of nasturtiums. And if you wave your hands over um, the nasturtiums, you pick up that smell pretty, pretty quickly, that sort of peppery scent. Um, yet yeah, actually um, attracts cabbage moth. So by putting in um, nasturtiums throughout your garden, uh, it's, it's doing a sort of mix of things depending on the pest. The other good thing about nasturtiums and, and all the herbs that Ben mentioned, um, which, you know, it isn't your typical... Um, Actually, I can see right there on this, on this nasturtium leaf. I'm not sure if you've got to see it, but there is a cabbage moth egg just up from this, the center about there. Um, so it just goes to show. Um, but yeah, so these, these guys, you can eat them. They're great salad greens. I'll prove it to you right now. Um, really peppery, adds a lot, adds that sort of mm, great, greatness to a salad. Um, the other parts of, of them, the flowers, um, just goes to show that that's not actually a plastic plant as well. Um, wanted to prove that to you. But the flowers are also edible. You can eat the whole thing. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're not only just used for um, repelling or attracting insects. Also, I'll see if I can find one. Um, the pods. There we go. So we've got the, um, the nasturtium pods there, which are known as the poor man caper. So if you are into pickling um, or not into pickling and want to get into pickling, these things are brilliant for pickling. Um, and yeah, add that sort of, they're like that vinegary caper with a burst of pepper at the end. So amazing little um, little trick to, to pull out. Um, but obviously, second to that, they throw them in the garden and they come straight up again. Okay, so they, um, they're prolific self-seeders. So a really... Um, great benefit of, of nasturtiums. The other one, um, great flower to have is, I mean, there's heaps of them, but marigolds. Um, so we're talking about cabbage moth and, and marigolds actually repel um, cabbage moth too. Um, I think most calendulas do, Ben. Is that, is that to your knowledge as well? Yeah, yeah. And for those who might want to go out and buy your marigolds, it's not a good time now, but James is right. It's another repellent in your garden. Um, but Calendula, once you've got calendula in your garden, and, we'll, and you know we talk about parsley, a lot of the plants we've talked about, if you let one healthy plant go to seed, these will come up in your garden continually. Um, last week, week's episode, we are at Sarah's and she's thrown out barrage, as we called it, James, or borage, um, throughout her garden, and she could provide enough borage plants for the whole of Torquay, I would have thought. Um, so you can start placing plants within your garden. I, I think what I wanted to elaborate with James's great uh, little chat on nasturtium is that plants in gardens don't just have one function. Like if we start looking at plants as having multiple functions in your garden and another one with nasturtium is, it's actually a ground cover and it can protect your soil. So especially in summer, nasturtium across your soils um, can, can really keep your soils nice and uh, moist mm -hmm. and healthy. Um, if you've got too much of it, because it can get away from you, you just can prune it and it's another layer in that nodig garden that we built in the first episode. Or it can just go into your compost. So all of these plants that we're discussing um, 
if you view them as not just, okay, I just want to put carrots in my garden and get a harvest of carrots, there's, there's that next level of letting, letting plants, uh, I don't know, go through their full cycle, I suppose, is what we're trying to get at, James. And yep. We're not saying, plant, you know, let parsley take over your whole bed. It's about being strategic. But again, when you're going out and planting a veggie garden this weekend, don't just go out and plant cauliflower and um, broccoli. Put in, you know, a rosemary hedge on the border or even put in one, you know, uh, thyme or coriander seeds mixed in. Start putting in more like 10 plants in a, in a garden bed that might be two by one square metres or whatever size it is. Try and get... A lot of diversity even within that and you'll have more success and at you know dealing with all these pests that we're talking about so it's a really it's a bigger picture approach i suppose is what we're um yep. we're trying to stress and if you're not sure about the you didn't watch last week and not sure about the rosemary don't go out and buy rosemary um just <laughs> and stick it in the ground or rip the leaf. Yeah. Look, look at last week's video and, and you'll quickly find out how to do a rosemary cutting. Um, Petrina mentions um, on the chat line that um, landcress is, is a great one to combat um, the cabbage moth as well because they're attracted to it. It's, it's an, a fantastic one to plant with your brassicas um, because yes, they are attracted to it, but as soon as they eat it, it's actually toxic to them and they die. Um, so, and it's another great ground cover. It is cress, watercress is, is, is so easy to grow. The root system, if you ever buy cress from, um, from your grocer or wherever and have that roots, the root system, simply cut off the roots, spread it out and stick it in your garden and it will take off. So it's a great one to have because you can eat it, um, but it's also a really fantastic um, companion um, plant as well. Um, the other, so look, one, one thing we're going to talk about next week is, um, is the soil talking about how how to get healthy soil going? So we won't touch too much on worms today in in getting your soil healthy. But if if I just quickly say that healthy soil is actually going to create healthy plants, and it's known that pests will actually prey on on unhealthy plants. So things um, like aphids will will always go for the the least healthy plant amongst the lot. So if if you've got um, healthy soil and really sort of healthy plants. Um, they're going to be less susceptible to um, to getting smashed by pests, basically. So um, next week is all about worms and composting, I think. Composting. Um, but yeah, we'll certainly talk about building that soil health other than what we talked about in the first week being lasagna um, gardening. Um, ben, do you want to, should we talk about some basic tricks and pests sort of methods to keep, keep them away before we go to some questions? Sure. Yep. So there's a few different techniques we can use. Um, one, especially this time of year, I've had success in having a good netting over my brassicas. Um, so you don't need to keep a net up at the whole time. But if, if anyone's, apparently there's a lot around and I've seen a lot in my garden where I'm renting. Um, James and Sarah both mentioned that they seem more prevalent this year. Um, last year I had some broccoli plants that I planted and with nets yep. over them and there's a cabbage moth flying around inside of the net. So, um, yeah, I'm not too happy. Yeah. With that. So make sure your netting system is <laughs> correctly. James is what I <laughs> would stress, but I had, uh, that issue last winter and I was like, no, I'm going to try netting and that actually worked really effectively. Um, the other uh, things you can do in your garden, um, just some quick wins, is when you when you plant, and we've talked about this in the first and second episode, is to when you're putting in your uh, seedlings, um, to put a little bit of coffee ground around your seedlings. Um, also, a yogurt container, chop it off at the bottom. Um, there's all these little techniques, eggshells, people have used the eggshells and crushed them up. There's different little techniques that you can use uh, for spe specific little problems like codling moth. Uh, we haven't really talked so much about fruit trees, but a lot of people talk about how do you deal with problems in different fruit trees. Oh, well, codling moth, you can put a hessian bag around the base of the trunk 
or a, car, a crinkled cardboard um, and you just put that around the base and leave it for a couple of weeks and then throw it in the bin basically um, because you, you're uh, attracting the pest onto those uh, hessian bag and then you try and get rid of them. That's worked for me in the past. But just on that with apple trees, uh, when, when we moved into our house in Geelong 10 years ago, we inherited a beautiful old apple tree um, and it was full of codling moth. Um, and I've used different techniques over the 10 years to try and get rid of uh, the codling moth. Still got codling moth, but it's much less prevalent now. Um, and I've tried different strategies. We've um, put the chooks in there every year and netted off the whole tree and let the chickens do their thing for a while. Um, I've planted garlic underneath um, and had a great garlic crop at the same time underneath the bed. I've put in a seed bomb where I've had caleng calendulas, our friend Borage, um, you know, the onion family, lots of different plants. So underneath fruit trees, don't think that you just have to isolate your fruit tree. It's actually not the best way uh, to go about it. I've got um, comfrey growing around the base of my, a lot of my fruit trees, and they are helping the soil. They're dynamic accumulators, which go have really deep roots, go down into uh, the soil and bring up really valuable nutrients, which the tree feeds, feeds off as well. So we're probably getting a bit more technical, but again, James, I think we're trying to, I, I don't think there's any harm in just going out into your garden and having a go on planting lots of things. Like the worst thing you can do is not plant lots of things. Like just get out there, get your soil right and go crazy. Just fill up all those spaces. You can always pull out a lot of plants. Obviously not fruit trees, it's a bit trickier. But if you've got too much coriander, oh, that's not such a problem anyway, is it? Or you've got too much parsley, you can pull these out and put them into your compost. But you want to create a bit more, what's that? Or make pesto or... Exactly, exactly. Good, good problems. But if you've got bare, I see garden spaces as opportunities where even along fences, um, more marginal spaces, like really hot rocky spots, you can put succulents in, rocks, that's going to create an environment for lizards and they're going to go and wander into your veggie garden as well because there'll be food for them in there. So... Um, on birds, create, having a bird bath is another little trick because birds will come in for water, especially over, you know, drier periods. And what do they do? They're opportunistic. That's what um, insects, birds, lizards, frogs, if they see food, they'll grab it. But if you don't have the environment within your home or garden uh, to attract them, of course, your aphids and all these other animals are going to win out. We don't want them to win. Hey ben. hey, ben, can I just jump in and ask if you, we've had a few questions come up in the chat. Yes. Um, uh, first one with regards to the apple trees. Um, someone was just asking when you put the hessian and the cardboard around the base of your trees. I think you can do it from now, Sarah. Um, I've tried it. I think it's a bit of trial and error, but uh, definitely over winter, um, but even late autumn through through winter is when I've, I've uh, tried that method. Um, Great. You also mentioned, um, oh, a question, sorry, has come up about curly leaf, especially with your nectarines, uh, things like that. How can we treat curly leaf on stone fruit? Yep. So again, um, at my house, I've, I've had curly leaf issues um, and varying in different seasons, but I tried a copper spray, uh, not last season, the season before, which you you can apply, um, and that that did help. Um, otherwise, I I pick off the curly leaves, and sometimes I understand trees are absolutely riddled with it, but the new growth actually um, didn't have the curly leaves, so but I'd try a copper spray. Um, which has worked for me. James, have you had experience with that? 
Yeah, only um, I've only had it in a small amount on some citrus and curly. Uh, sorry, yeah, picking off the the leaves um, is is one of it. Yeah, cover spray is the one I've always uh, known to be the the best solution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was also one Ben um, when you mentioned uh, comfrey before. Um, yep. Uh, from Petrina. So is there a trick to controlling comfrey once it's in? Uh, I found that it's uh, became quite invasive and hard to control. Well, there's lots of gardeners looking for comfrey. So a good shovel uh, can deal with, I, I don't find it that invasive compared to, you know, I think it's a good invasive plant. Let's yep. put it that way. Cause it's yep. such a, an amazing plant in your garden. We can talk a bit about comfrey. It's a compost activator. Um, you can literally mow over that stuff and it just comes back fighting, um, you know, letting it go to flower again, bringing uh, beneficial insects. Um, if yes, it does spread. Um, so having it in specific. So when you do plant it, think about where it is that it's going to spread potentially. I've got it mainly underneath my fruit trees. Um, I find it's just another input in my garden that I just chop down and literally chop and drop it. And it's just another mulch layer or I feed the chooks, chooks love comfrey, um, or I'll put it, you can make comfrey teas, you know, getting back to one plant having so many beneficial, um, well, so many benefits to your garden. Um, but sorry, I can't remember who had that question, but if you let us know, we might come and dig some up ourselves, James, Done. and put it, put it into a new community garden project that we're working on. I guess the we other need... thing with uh, conference <laughs> is that um, it's been touched on good garden design. So if it is under, a, under fruit trees or it's in a contained garden bed that you're happy for it to, to spread out and take over, great ground cover, but also bringing up those nutrients from... Um, the soil below the surface. Um, if it is that you, it, okay, it's taken over too much and it's, it's in a garden bed, which was, wasn't meant to take over. Um, that first technique, back to the lasagna um, layering, put cut, like chop it out, put cardboard down, use it actually as one of the layers of nitrogen in your, in your lasagna. Um, you know, add on some manure, add on some piece drawer, do, do the layering system and, and that will sort of definitely combat it. Um, so that's, that's one way of controlling it um, other than doing yeah. the hard tracker of ripping it out. And often, like, I think you've touched on something there, James, like plants, uh, they have a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with other plants next to them. Like if you put a cauliflower next to a garlic next to radish next to whatever it is, um, and this is a, probably a topic we haven't talked about, James, but we can talk about. A lot of people um, ask about companion planting or crop rotation. So when we're talking about crop rotation, that is very hard in a backyard setting to go, to, you know, to, to rotate your different families of vegetables every year and having a, a specific um, plan around that. Mm. In my experience, uh, I haven't done that at my house, but what I've done is, small plantings uh, across the whole vegetable garden. So I don't just have like one or two beds. I look at the whole garden and, and look at different opportunities to grow vegetables under fruit trees, for example. But one tip that you can do to stop disease the next year um, is like this year, wherever you've planted your tomatoes, don't plant them in the same spot next year. Or if you've planted your zucchinis and pumpkins in a certain patch this year, try to avoid that next year. Um, but more so for me, it's about, again, really building on your soil year in, year out and planting diversity, which includes not just vegetables, but herbs, perennials. And then, I mean, just within my backyard, I've found that strategy of really good soil and a diverse range of plants, including fruit trees as well, means I don't get uh, insect problems to the point where you know all my seedlings are getting munched as soon as I put them out I haven't had I had that experience when I started in my garden you know when it was a not a not a diverse garden and it was full of problems but I just worked on the soil worked on diversity of plants 
And guess what? Birds started coming in, frogs, lizards, all these things we talk about, it actually works. And when you sit down in your garden and you observe that, then it's like, ah, I've put two and two together. If I put this plant in, it's amazing. Um, it attracts, you know, whatever it is, you know, whether it's a bird or an insect, but just have a look at what happens when you do put plants in. And James had that experience, you know, planting a thousand natives at, uh, you know, at a, at a previous project. I've had the same experience on a larger scale as well, where, you know, you watch a blue wren come into your garden. They don't just come in, you know, for specific things. They'll, they'll see opportunities underneath the cabbages and they'll go get that little green worm and do the job for you. So you don't have to, you're not doing the work. You're creating the environment that's going to work for you. Um, ben, I've got rabbiting. one question. Just rabbiting on a bit, sorry. That's all right. I'll, I'll interrupt you before you keep going and chuck in a few jokes Thanks. as well. Um, we had another question from Sue back earlier on when we were talking about rosemary. Um, does coastal yep. rosemary work in the same way? Now, I haven't, I haven't actually experienced um, using coastal rosemary. Have you before, Ben? I haven't actually. No, I'd like to, if anyone's got an answer to that one. Um, so if you are, to, I think... um, go and test it for us and let us know. I'd love to, love to find out. But I think any plant that's got an arom, like it's aromatic, is beneficial for me. So I put a lot of aromatic plants in the garden, which yep. you touched on earlier, James, when you, um, you know, brush up against wormwood or whatever the plant is. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess also looking at things, um, things that, that, that grow not only native things. So I love planting indigenous edibles, um, which, which, uh, you know, they belong here. So, um, generally, if they belong, they'll they'll grow really healthy, and they are less susceptible to plant uh, to, to pests. So, um, looking at different things, um, even like warrigal greens. Warrigal greens are one thing which you stick in the ground and they take over. Um, so many benefits. Chooks love them. Um, you know, you stick them in your compost, but using them as a spinach replacement is um, is something that's it, it, yeah, they're amazing for you. So, so such a good gut um, alkalizer. Um, and so many antioxidants in them as well. So um, a really beneficial plant to have in your garden. They do take over quite a bit. So, so keeping them sort of contained is something which some gardeners find frustrating. Um, but yeah, so many different benefits to them um, having them in the garden. And, Other things which and, are very sort of pest tolerant, uh, like coriander, um, silver beets also pretty, pretty good. Broad beans is another fantastic one, plus has the benefit of fixing nitrogen in the soil. Um, so lots of benefits to those plants. But yeah, as we said before, a range of herbs is also um, great to plant. And also just on that, James, I think it's good to talk about fruit trees. Um, if you're new to gardening, maybe planting, there are fruit trees that are a lot less work and a bit hardier um, and you don't have as many issues. Like we talked about nectarines and peaches. I love ne nectarines and peaches. But some plants, and I think, fruit trees in particular, we need to start looking at what's appropriate on the surf coast. And if you're tuning in from a different area, but Mediterranean uh, varieties, um, we also, you might not have to net against the possums. So coming back to pests, um, yeah, sure, your possums might have a go at citrus, but, you know, citruses, um, fajoas, pomegranates, you know, there's a range of fruit trees that, you can put in that are hardy, need less water and are less susceptible to pests, basically. Mm. Like birds, we want the little birds in the garden, but obviously just some are gone. We don't want those king parrots or eastern rosellas or those birds coming in for all of our stone fruits, for example. So if you've got a small, smaller space, maybe thinking, okay, what, what is the best? You know, fig trees, for example, can get big, harder to net, and the birds and bats is another pets. I've had uh, bats come into our property in uh, in Geelong and decimate uh, a fig tree that I hadn't net netted appropriately and early enough. So, yeah, just thinking what plants are appropriate in your environment is really important. 
I um, had success. There's no other questions at the moment, so I'll wait to see if there's any other questions come in. But yeah, recently had um, did an Indigenous edible garden in Torquay, which, and relating back to the first week as well, looking at your area and, and what's going to be relevant um, in fruit trees um, or, or growing food in general. But this was a small sort of courtyard, northern facing, quite protected. Um, so I had a go at finger limes, um, which. Uh, now I just got a message the other day saying we've got all these finger limes. What do we do? Um, so yeah, they they've been successful even though they're a more northern plant. Um, just because it's it's out of their climate doesn't mean you can't necessarily grow it if your condition is is correct. So that's right. Um, what do you think, Sarah? Friend? We might we might ask if uh, we open up to a couple of questions or how are we going for time. Yeah, yeah, I think let's open it up to questions. So if anyone has got some questions, as I said, feel free to either type them in the chat and James, Ben and I can see that or, um, or unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Okay. I think while we're waiting, I think all these topics are sort of, I think you'll get a theme coming through uh, that a lot of the topics are related, whether it's soil, plants, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll be hammering this home, won't we, James, over the next uh, few weeks? Yes, we will. Hey, now, we've just had a great question coming from Danielle. Um, Danielle asked, where do we get plants from locally that you might not find at Bunnings? Now, it's, it's funny you say that, Danielle, because um, Bunnings has a great selection of seedlings that generally aren't in season or ones that we talked about last week, I wouldn't be planting from seedling like root vegetables. Um, so yeah, look, plants from your local nurseries are um, fantastic and um, there's some great nurseries around the place. Um, if they haven't got them in stock either, they, they're plant lovers generally and they, they will find them for you and, and get them in. So can't recommend enough going to nurseries and talking, talking to them. Um, and yeah, talking about um, what you're after and, and even giving them your sort of environment, your location, um, what your aspect is, bit of, bit of rough detail. And they'll actually sort of pick things to your, um, to your area. A, a great one in Geelong is actually the Gen U nursery, um, which grow a lot of, um, plants for bar and water. Um, they grow indigenous plants to this area. So um, if, it's, if it's more of an indigenous garden you want to get going, there's a lot of edibles in there as well. Um, but as we, as we mentioned, also fantastic for getting um, diverse, diversity in your garden too. So go to local nurseries. Yep. And just on at Bunnings, um, it is one place actually that you can't, and I'm not endorsing Bunnings, uh, but it is one place where you can get diggers seedlings. Um, if there's still tomatoes, which can happen like James referred to, you know, tomatoes or if they're selling tomatoes or pumpkins, um, don't go anywhere near those. But the good thing about diggers seedlings is that they're um, heirloom varieties. So um, it's hard to buy seedlings of, I haven't really found anywhere else on the surf coast. So if you're really after heirloom seedlings, that's one advantage. Okay. As we mentioned last week, as though if you're buying heirloom seeds, um, we can certainly get some good ones locally. Um, Birdland seeds uh, sell some great seeds. Um, yeah, on the surf coast. I also jump yeah. in there. Another another great way to get plants locally is um, a lot of like um, there's vegetable and seed swaps and forums, especially here on the surf coast. And your local community garden often will have um, seeds or seedlings as well that you can access. So it's worth connecting in uh, with some of those groups as well. And also, Sarah, I think that's a good point. At the moment, I've noticed a bit of a one of the positives that's coming out of COVID. Um, people are putting plants out the front i've seen a lot of uh so someone mentioned the comfrey before um if you can't to get up maybe get a neighbor to help you but potting up things uh for your neighbors um so sarah you could pot up all of those borage plants for your street but there's so many seeds that come up and that's how i share a lot of plants um calendulas there's it's pretty easy to seed a lot of plants it's just learning how to identify what they are when they've come up in your garden. So getting to know a good gardener locally, you might be able to put, not have to even go to a nursery. Um, so it's a good point, Sarah. 
Can I ask Sarah, um, has the Surf Coast Shire considered um, actually setting up some, something where uh, seedlings could be sold to the local people and raise a bit of money for something, but yeah, through the community garden in Torquay or elsewhere? A good question, Sue. We haven't actually considered that, if I'm to be honest, but um, it is something I will take note of. That's um, a good suggestion. Thank you. So if I can jump in on that one, um, Ben and I and Sarah are working on a project at the moment, which will potentially uh, have an offshoot of that as well. So keep your ear to the ground about a project in Torquay coming up. Sounds good. Um, I particularly wanted to know about codling moth because I've had huge problems with it in the last couple of years with apple trees. I've actually ended up pulling one out uh, and now it seems to be spreading to pear trees as well. So I really, I'm almost at the point where I'm going to pull up the apple tree because it just, yeah, I don't know what to do. Mm. Well, I think from my perspective and having had that experience, um, Again, it's a multi-pronged attack mm. and I don't think it's isolating and going, well, let's just try one, one strategy. Let's, yep. okay, winter's a perfect time um, to really do a note. I've done, and this is a process I've used and it, it's, it's helped. It hasn't eliminated it. And this is a point I'd like to make, you know, you're always going to have issues within your garden. Um, but I hope, hope what we're trying to get across today is all these strategies will lessen the problems that come into your garden. But just on apple, that apple tree, I did a no-dig garden um, over winter. And then in spring, I did a border around the whole plant, uh, the fruit tree, sorry, on the edges. And that was mint, actually. But I contained the mint. I wouldn't usually say do mint, but I had to go with mint. And then I did a layer of... And I gradually went in towards the trunk. So I did a crop of garlic and then I did calendulas. Um, and I actually did a seed bomb where I threw out a whole heap of things and basically filled up the whole garden bed with a diversity of plants. And I tried that method um, with the hessian bag around the trunks. And I also got the chickens into that area. So I've yeah. tried about you know, five different methods now, who's to say which one might be benefiting? But I'd rather have a go at all those different methods as opposed to just having the magic bullet. So yep. maybe just that's, so that's with my the, strategy. Yeah, mm. with the Hessian, when do you put it up? Yeah, you could. I'd, I'd be getting out there and having a go now. Okay, sure. And yeah, and you could, okay. you could use, I think you could use um, just use coffee bags actually. Um, I know locally Ocean Grind in Geelong, we're giving some of those away. They also make a great layer in your worm farm as well. Yep. So you could try Browns, that. Yeah, we've got a coffee machine and we put it, usually put it into the compost. Um, and how far out from the tree were you? was your garden bed? Uh, the garden bed goes out to where the canopy finishes. Okay, yep. Um, but the plants, like it's a bit of a myth that you can't grow things underneath fruit trees. I grow all sorts of things underneath fruit trees. It's, fruit trees like companions. They, the companions they don't like are kaikuyu or, you know, any invasive grasses. Yep. Um, although I did learn a lesson one year, I grew epic broad beans, which grew into my grapefruit. And that was the pest to the grapefruit. And yes. um, so, you, you know, you sort of use a bit of common sense. If your garden's got too much of something, sure, pull it out. But that's just another layer to go into your compost. All right, I'll so, give it a try. Thanks. So the, the one other thing, the um, coddling moth, I think um, white oil and water um, sprayed on, this is after winter. So when the weather starts warming up um, again, um, but spraying on every couple of weeks um, is yeah one way is another another way to combat it too. So try to so cut. would that be once before the buds open or when the buds are there or so this is um, to prevent eggs hatching. Um, so 
when would that uh, yeah, so applying sort of weekly or every fortnight um it it should definitely probably want to eliminate but it'll certainly reduce their numbers greatly um but yep. if you're doing all the other techniques chooks are, um i was working with a school once and they basically just hammered their orchards putting chooks around every single tree and had a great result um but yeah the cardboard and the the cloth or the hessian is also you know yeah multi-pronged approach yep but when would you start with the white oil oh so yeah so when when the sort of coming into spring um when when it sort of gets above 15 degrees i'd say so maybe um september september okay great yep. give it a try give it a go you've got a few projects on the go so you've got the it was it you as well with the rosemary uh yes <laughs> All right, get back to us on the rosemary and the coddling moth. Yes, we'll do. Okay, Ben and James, we've also had a question. Um, what is good to grow near rose bushes? Near roses? Yes, near roses, yeah. I won't answer that. I'll let you answer that, Ben. Because <laughs> I'd probably, yeah, no, I might offend the roses. Well, roses, I mean, I, I do like roses but in the right environment because they're prickly buggers. Um, you know, the classic pottager garden, you know, French garden where you, you have a, a single rose in the, uh, in the middle of the garden. Um, I've encountered that in previous jobs where I took the roses out, but um, roses are incredibly hardy. Um, I tend to, I don't think roses are the best plant choice within an edible garden let's um this might be controversial but what i'm talking about is practicalities like roses you've got to prune you've got to get to so what i'm saying is don't do, it's not don't plant them geez i'm digging myself a hole here aren't i James? <laughs> i'm getting i'm getting somewhere with this i just put them in an appropriate spot where it's easy to deal with them and they can grow in really marginal spaces so we've got roses growing out the front of our house down a western flank of the house and it's a spot which is pretty marginal but they grow really well so uh i haven't really answered your question about what to grow under there i think it's where you put them in your environment and basically you still want to cover your soil don't don't leave bare soil so it might be some um uh ground cover plants potentially like succulents even in that environment um yeah, roses, though. I don't know, James. So, no, probably. look, I, I have had experience with herbs below roses. Um, yeah. Like oregano um, and um, dives, um, just as a ground cover. Um, so, yeah, different array of herbs, I suppose, would be yep. something I would suggest. Yep. Um, there was a question here for the finger limes. Um, great that you've got finger limes so um look yeah they, they do like a warm environment so northerly facing is ideal um coming into now before frosts i'd be either dragging them under cover um, or even inside um, just to really protect them from the frost um that we will be having coming soon um, um but so to... not... sorry mate we've also got a question on oxalis this is a good one at this time of year uh, the questions from Danielle, lots of oxalis coming up, don't want to spray. Is there an organic spray that would deal them or what are the alternatives? So in my experience with oxalis, if you can get the little bulbs that are, and if you just pull out the top of the plant, the green part of the plant, you won't get rid of oxalis. And it is a pretty invasive uh, plant that you don't want it well. I don't think you want in your garden. I've basically dug garden beds out and removed all those tiny little bulbs and started again. That's one alternative. If you've got a big bed and it's absolutely full of it, um, there are organic sprays that you can use, aren't there, James? Uh, the pine, um, what's the name of the pine needle uh, spray? I always forget it. Anyway, you can look into that. Have you come across that, James? Or Sarah? Yeah. No. Sarah's. Um, yes, I, I'm just trying to remember its name too, Ben, because I've used that in my garden before. And now yeah, I'm sorry, I meant to blank with that. But 
yeah, you basically want to get under the plant, get those little bulbs out and chip away at it. If you've got a larger area of it and it's in a vegetable garden, for example, I'd be almost starting again with that and trying to eliminate it. Same as you would with Kaikuya or Cooch. Um, yeah, it's a tricky little plant. Mm. Got another question regarding the pest, the cabbage moth. Oh, I knew we'd be talking cabbage moth a bit more from Andre. I have planted five pak choys. I've been cleaning from cabbage moth once to twice a day, even so they have lots of bites. Do you think it could be anything else that I should look for? What do you reckon, James? Uh, it might be, again, within those pak choys, Try to get some diversity if you've got space within that garden. So herbs, other plants, coriander, um, put some seeds in. Because a lot of people, when they plant gardens out, there's an opportunity, and we talked about this last week, James, was when the seedling's quite small, yeah, sure, it might take up a bigger area once it's bigger, but you've got an opportunity to plant in between those spaces um, with other plants to to make the most of that area. So yep. again, Andre, I think it's coming back to um, a multi-pronged um, approach to dealing with any pests in the garden. So can't really uh, help you. I would suggest getting out there and rubbing off all the eggs, if there's any eggs on them, um, and if there's any actual caterpillars themselves, getting them off too. Um, getting some milk containers or yogurt containers, if it's milk containers, cutting off the bottoms and just sticking them over the top um, to protect them from further cabbage moth laying any more eggs. So that's that would be um, something to to combat that immediately. Um, but yeah, as Ben said, planting a few things around them as well. So there will be this time of year. You're getting another question that's coming from Sue, my colleague, and Brock, and netted still being eaten. Um, again, what James said: take the net off and try and squish a few, a few of those bugs. Um, have lots of different tips and techniques up your sleeve. And I think that comes back to what James and I have sort of covered throughout this workshop is there's no magic bullet to this stuff. It's soil, it's planting, uh, a variety, a diversity of plants, getting a really diverse environment. Um, all of these things that we've mentioned I'm using the hammer technique again, James, but that's where you're going to have success. And it's not a, sh that's a long-term approach to gardening. And you will start winning if you start doing some of the things that we're advocating for. Um, in the early days, especially if you've just planted a new garden bed, it's very likely you'll have more issues because you haven't got that diversity in your garden. And James and I, I've experienced at my house when I moved in 10 years ago, whatever I planted, it was infuriating. I'd plant it and it'd get eaten the next day. Um, so just hang in there and keep planting. Some things will take. Put in broad beans instead of broccoli, maybe, if you're really new to it. That's what I'd suggest. Well, thanks everyone for joining us again this week. I hope that answered a few of your questions around pests and diseases. Make sure you tune in next week for week four as we focus on, again, healthy soil, how to compost and how to keep a worm farm. Until then, we'll see you later.